Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm so excited to be here. Always a great time to be able to talk to you and to talk to my guests. And we have a great show for you coming up tonight. We have a repeat offender uh, returning guest. We're so happy that Vijay Prashad is coming back to the show. Um, this, of course, is the Katie Helper Show, which you can find on YouTube. You can find us on podcast form, um, wherever you listen to your podcast. And you can also get exclusive extended uh, content at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And what we're going to do on this episode, like we did last episode, and we do this frequently, is that uh, if you're watching this live, you get to watch the whole thing for free. And then if you're watching this later, um, part of this will be at available only at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. But we always provide you with free content every week. We just have some uh, parts of it that are for Patreon subscribers only. So I'll let you know during the stream when that happens. Um, so today we have joining us again, Vijay Prashad. He is an Indian historian, editor, and journalist. He is a writing fellow and chief correspondent at Globetrotter. He is the chief editor of Left Word Books and the director of Tri-Continental Institute for Social Research. He is a senior non-resident fellow at Changyang Institute for Financial Studies, Renmin University of China. And he's written more than 20 books, including The Darker Nations and The Poorer Nations. And his latest book is Washington Bullets with an introduction by Evo Morales Aima. And um, before we start, I'm going to bring him in a second, but everyone make sure that you like the stream. This helps with the algorithm. So just pr press like. Also share the stream. We want to make sure that the, we get the word out about the stream because uh, Vijay is such an important figure and such a uh, says so many things that are so hard to to find. This perspective is really hard to find. More and more, as we know, there's been so much censorship. So we want to make sure that we uh, get the word out so that people can hear what Vijay has to say. And um, I don't need to convince you of that because you all love him and know him. Um, so without any further ado, I'm bringing in Vijay Prashad. Hello, welcome. Hi, it's great to be with you. Thanks a lot. And um, uh, congratulations for still being on the air. Thank you. I know. It's just uh, just waiting for, I feel bad. Like, what does Abby, Abby Martin have that I don't besides RT behind her? Okay, I can't feel, I can't take it personally too much because that is a difference, but it's true. We've had on Abby Martin, Lee Camp, Christopher, Hed Chris Hedges. Of course, they all work for, have worked for RT, but it's ridiculous because um, having your archive taken down years after is just doesn't even make sense within the framework of the censorious uh, Neil McCarthy uh, framework that people are using right now. So um, welcome and thank you. And uh, you're also someone who's in the in the best tradition, I would say, you know, you're doing something right when you're smeared, when you're the victim of McCarthy and Neil McCarthy smears. So obviously you're doing something right, too, because we have people who are um, going after you with very spurious claims, uh, specious claims. And uh, you always do an amazing job defending yourself because you just have truth on, this, on your side, which uh, is a really convenient thing to do. But uh, to have, I want to talk to you, of course, about Russia and Ukraine, but I also want to talk to you about the anniversaries of uh, we have the 19 year old anniversary of the Iraq war. We also have the 10 year anniversary of the um, NATO uh, attacks on Libya. Those are two things that you're involved. You were you covered. And I think it's important for people to know why these wars are relevant, both in the general context, but what these wars teach us about the invasion today of Ukraine and more perhaps significantly about the media's coverage of said invasion? I know, big question. <laughs> well, big question, Katie, but... it's actually, it's a superb way to start. It, it is um, the anniversary of the illegal U.S. war on Iraq. Um, again, illegal, it's a pretty strong word, but it's not my word. Um, it's the word used by the United Nations Secretary General in 2004. Kofi Annan w went on BBC a year after the United States began to destroy Iraq and called it an illegal war. Um, that's, I think, a pretty strong judgment. Um, you know, Biden has been dancing around this phrase, war criminal, using this phrase on uh, to describe Mr. Putin. Uh, now, maybe it's a correct phrase. Let's leave that aside. But... 
given that the UN Secretary General called the war against Iraq an illegal war, started in March 2003, a war of aggression, um, therefore, there are culpabilities. If, if you're going to say something, you're the head of the United Nations. If you're going to say something like, hey, listen, this is an illegal war. It's a war of aggression. By the way, we now trigger the Nuremberg question, Nuremberg being the trials of the German leadership for pursuing a war of aggression in Europe in 1939, first against Czechoslovakia and Austria and so on. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to say war of aggression, illegal war, somebody should have been tried for war crimes. Uh, that's axiomatic. It follows directly, uh, which means that George Bush and his entire clique uh, were in fact war criminals. I was actually quite surprised to watch, I believe it was a clip from MSNBC where Condoleezza Rice, um, a name now less familiar to many people, she was the national security advisor for George W. Bush during the war on Iraq, the illegal war. Condoleezza Rice, by the way, has an oil tanker named after her called the Condoleezza Rice. Um, that's the proximity between the Bush administration and oil companies. Condoleezza Rice was told by the host, they, they were talking about the Russian attack on, on Ukraine, where they said, you know, this kind of thing has never happened. Um, no, since 1945, no nuclear power country has invaded another country. And I'm thinking, good God, you know, you're actually saying this is, a, this is fake news because forget all the other attacks by the United States, you know, forget all of them, forget Panama, forget every other attack on the, that the United States conducted. But Iraq, 2003, how could, you, how could you forget that, you know? And Condoleezza Rice sitting across from you is the one who was in the decision-making for that war. And yet on U.S. television today, fake news gets by. You know, Iraq were elided. And the last thing I want to say about this, Katie, because I think it is really important. You mentioned media coverage of this war. We're basically living in an international division of humanity. You know, we're, we're journalists, you know, self-respecting journalists from ABC News and so on. Self-respecting journalists can say things like, I'm shocked that there's a war in Europe, blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, things like that, where borders open directly. And, you know, there's like parliamentary discussions about got to let every Ukrainian in. But screw the Syrians, screw the Iraqis, screw the Afghans, screw the Yemenis, screw them all. That's an international division of humanity. You know, certain people are human. Others are basically animals and you get to bomb them. And it's not a war. You know, United States didn't prosecute a war in Iraq because that's not a war against human beings. This is a war because it's against people who have blonde hair and blue eyes. And I mean, that actually drives me nuts. Um, forget all the kind of attacks on on RT and all of that, you know, that's that's to be expected because there's a shallowness in, in the Western uh, institutions. They are extraordinarily shallow with their ideas of press freedom and things. I don't have respect for them in terms of, of these values. But on this, I mean, our fellow reporters going on air, you know, saying things like, I shouldn't say this, but this is in Europe. I mean, I'm thinking, have you lost your mind you were there in Baghdad. Do you think Baghdad deserves to be bombed and the capital of Ukraine doesn't deserve to be bombed? I mean, I think neither deserve to be bombed, just for the record, in case anybody's checking. I believe neither deserve to be bombed. But is that what you're saying when you say, for God's sake, a European city? That to me, Katie, that's the heart of this question with Ukraine. You know, forget NATO expansion. This war demonstrates that the Western um, consciousness lives in the sewer. That's what this war demonstrates to me. Yeah. And, and it was actually Condoleezza Rice appeared on, it was Fox news, but to be fair, they're so indistinguishable, uh, when it comes to coverage of this issue, you can't really tell which network you're watching. And it was really stunning to watch Condoleezza Rice condemn what she described as the invasion of a sovereign country. It's like, are you just upset because someone else is doing it and you wanted to have the monopoly? on that? Like, do you feel threatened? Um, but that was quite an unbelievable moment. Um, and can you talk about Libya? Because that's something that I think most Americans uh, really, with, with Iraq, there were obviously there were American boots on the ground. 
Um, a lot of Americans aren't aware at all of what happened in Libya and what the role of NATO was and the United States. Well, in August of this year, I'm really happy to let you know that um, Noam Chomsky and I are going to release a book called The Withdrawal. Um, you know, Noam is an incredible man. Um, we have been in a friendship for about 30 years, uh, began by me writing him a letter, you know, from India. Uh, and he responded to me. And I have the hard copy letters, his typed oh, wow. responses, you know, from the 1990s. And we corresponded right through, uh, became friends. You know, I'm a Marxist. Um, Noam is a kind of an anarchist, you know, and we don't share everything. And why should we? But we have a deep friendship and an understanding about um, the nature of, of the aggression of countries like the United States. Uh, a, a, a deep connection here. You know, I... I as he says, you know, you go and report these things from the front line and I think about them in my office. But in a way, there's a real synergy that's there. And this book is really quite interesting because we emphasize the three withdrawals of Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya. And the Libya case is so important, not only because, you know, I've, I have a long history with Libya. I went there as a little child in 1974 with my father. Um, in fact, it was magical, Katie. We drove from Alexandria, Egypt, uh, across past Tobruk. And in 1974, there were still German tanks that had been destroyed in World War II sitting in the battlefields of Tobruk and El Alamein and so on. It was magic for a little boy, you know. Um, and of course, the, the desert and so on. And as you cross the border, there was an enormous picture of Muammar Gaddafi. He had just been the head of government, five years. The coup was in 69. He was, you know, beautiful man, you know, in, in his youth. Seriously, like a, a, like a pin-up boy, you know, in a way. Um, and so I've had a long history with Libya, been there a number of times and so on. And in 2011, um, what was done to Libya is a crime, you know, a, a crime of the greatest magnitude. Yes, there were protests that broke out in Benghazi and others. In fact, I have friends who went out in protest, lawyers, human rights people, and so on. Um, in 2011, there was no evidence in February 2011 that there was going to be a massacre or anything like that. Um, the battalion, the, the army in Benghazi, in the eastern sector of Libya, defected to the rebels. You know, It was basically a civil war, actually. Um, there should have been a peace process. Gaddafi was, in fact, willing to have a ceasefire and so on. The head guy in Benghazi was Mahmoud Jibril, who was the financial advisor of the, at the, at the time, Emir of Qatar's wife. Um, he was her financial advisor. He came in as like the great hero, democratic hero. United States and France basically were backing the Benghazi rebellion fully saying that they are going to get genocide against by Gaddafi and so on. Um, I remember asking at the United Nations in early March of 2011, um, how do you know what's happening on the ground? And UN people were saying, look, we're, we, we don't have anybody in on the ground there, but we're following press reports. Well, which press? This is important. Which press? Well, not CNN, not MSNBC, not Fox. And as you say, they are pretty interchangeable. But none of them were on the ground. What were they following? They were following largely a newspaper called Al Arabiya. Now, Al Arabi, where is Al Arabi from? It's from Saudi Arabia. Well, who owns it? The royal family. They were essentially following the royal family's diktat regarding Libya. And, you know, the king of Saudi Arabia hated Gaddafi. Gaddafi used to go into these meetings and say to him, you're a dog of the Americans. You know, that's how Gaddafi spoke. This was a vendetta, you know. And NATO came in um, getting a UN Security Council resolution to the eternal shame of countries like China and Russia who allowed the resolution to go through. They didn't veto it. They allowed it to go through to their, I mean, it is a serious question that the Russians and Chinese need to ask. Why did they allow that to go through? Um, they allowed it to go through. Other countries abstained in that in that boat because they believed it was just going to be a quote-unquote no-fly zone. It's very instructive, Katie, for now when Zelensky is calling for a no-fly zone. They said it's going to be a no-fly zone. But actually, we know it wasn't. And Noam and I write about this because um, we know it wasn't because the African Union 
while the no fly zone was being prosecuted quote unquote i'll come to that the african union under jacob zuma arrived in um, benghazi gaddafi said i'm ready for a ceasefire then they went to sorry in tripoli then they went to benghazi met jibril and others and they said no ceasefire why because nato's airplanes were basically the air force of the rebellion they were bombing tripoli they, they destroyed many parts of the country and then after the war they refused to collaborate with the un uh, for an investigation about you know where they bombed and so on. refused peter olson the lawyer of nato told um, the united nations told security council that nato does not commit war crimes only barbarians commit war crimes not nato so this libya war is very instructive the west destroyed libya created you know a complete chaos in that country which exists till today you know 2011 till now that's 11 years later still complete chaos most people you know don't know the level of chaos in that country today um still offline as it were for the construction of institutions and no investigation of nato non non allowed because nato refuses and nobody has the authority to tell nato no we need to investigate you none at all and all because what a no fly zone zelensky wants a no fly zone what he really wants is for the western air force the nato air force to become the air force of ukraine that's what they really want and that's what is going to lead us into a major confrontation and that's why a no fly zone is really out of the question even biden and so on are wary of the no fly zone in this case because you don't want to see look even in syria the united states and russia very carefully divided up where their air forces could fly so that there would be no accidental clash if one of the other country brings down a plane it it's it's mayhem we don't know what's going to happen it's the jaws of hell beyond belief and um so what are your thoughts about the way the media is discussing this no fly zone that zelensky is calling for i think people are really struggling understandably with how to critique someone who is the president of a country that is um that has been invaded right and people again uh we on this show all the guests that have come on from chris hedges to you know abby martin on use on my other show useful idiots everyone is very emphatic in this declaring this an unjust um war no one has i mean i'll say i don't think it was unprovoked but it's unjust un indefensible um so i i think people that are are don't know exactly how to respond to zelensky calling for this because they don't want to seem like they're being insensitive to someone uh who's obviously in a very difficult position but you know our 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 responses to to a leader should not be based on on not wanting to hurt feelings so how do you advise people around this well look there's a couple of things um maybe three things one is the nature of this war uh, obviously it's a war obviously um it's inexcusable for a country to cross an international frontier it's a violation of the un charter uh in that sense it's it's obviously condemnable you know you condemn a military crossing the border attacking another country um unfortunately it's become completely normal for the united states to do this and therefore people have forgotten that there is such a thing called the un charter and that these kind of actions are exactly um inappropriate i mean in fact the us sanctions policy against 30 plus countries including venezuela cuba and so on is actually an act of war and is a violation of the sovereignty of countries like venezuela zimbabwe you know you name it there's 30 countries it's a long list including china and even before this conflict russia um so yeah i mean it's a violation of the un charter i get that uh, but also this is not a war that started in the 25th of of february 2022 um this is a war that begins in 2014 uh, that's why you had a process called the minks process Uh, in belarus the capital of belarus minsk there was a um, high level uh, agreement called minsk 2 where the parties by the way um, you know in the center of them was a very senior swiss diplomat who also did the investigation of the previous conflict in south ossetia you know between russia and georgia in 2008 she's a highly experienced diplomat 
uh, they sat together, they crafted the Minsk Agreement in 2014, which was to um, bring the tension down in the eastern provinces of Ukraine, in Lugansk and Donetsk. Now, over these eight years, Katie, 15, 14 to 15,000 people killed, 50,000 people injured. This is a UN figure. This is not made up. This is not Russian propaganda. This is a UN figure. What I would say is that I think the Russian government uh, failed to lift up sufficiently the gravity of what was happening in eastern Ukraine. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, Mr. Zelensky, before this particular invasion uh, took place, Mr. Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, made a speech saying, look, I understand that there are Nazi-like forces, Azov battalion and so on in the east. He said, but I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm of Jewish heritage and I'm also against the Nazis. At that time, wouldn't it have been interesting if Mr. Putin had gone on a plane and flown to the capital of Ukraine and met with Zelensky and said, listen, let's hold an, right now, let's hold an international conference against Nazism. Uh, Ukraine voted against a UN resolution, including the United States also, which condemned Nazism. Uh, why did Ukraine not vote to condemn Nazism at a UN General Assembly resolution? So Putin could have gone to, um, you know, uh, gone to, to the capital, sat with Zelensky, said, let's hold an international conference. Let's ask 193 countries to send representatives to condemn Nazism. But you see, he didn't do that. And in a way, the Russians didn't, as it were, to use an old Chomskyite phrase, manufacture consent. They didn't even go to the UN Security Council with a resolution. You know, imagine last year if they had gone to the UN Security Council and made a resolution, said that, you know, we have a resolution for Ukrainian forces to withdraw from Lugansk and Donetsk because 14,000 people are killed by UN documents. Um, therefore, we have a resolution. Forced the United States to veto that resolution. Forced the issue on the table. Forced the Europeans to develop some independence, to develop their own backbone. Because the Russians didn't do any of that, they didn't build basically um, the ground for the entry of their troops, the, the troop entry for, you know, basically the, the West and for Western media becomes the beginning of the conflict. Because these are not journalists who've been keeping up with, with what's happened in Eastern Ukraine. They don't seem to have even care. And, and if you start raising this issue, you get the old whataboutism argument you know well now you're being whataboutist well it's interesting the history of whataboutism goes to the question of irish republicanism that's where it first comes when the irish republicans um, began to attack you know civilian targets um, when they were attacked for that they said yeah but our civilians are being attacked all day you keep attacking our civilians and you know, then people said, well, now you're being whataboutists. Um, do you not condemn the attack of civilians and so on? So, you see, I feel very strong. We should strongly. reclaim that then. We should reclaim the whataboutist label. Well, firstly, people should know where it comes from. Yeah. It comes from British imperialist ideology against the Irish people in their struggle right. for liberation, you know. And so it's not a progressive argument when you say, oh, you're doing whataboutism. Right. Well, you're basically a British imperialist using that state argument. State terror, yeah. Embracing yeah. state terror, yeah. Um, sorry, I cut you off, though. No, no, no. I, I just, you know, I'm. Uh, these are, look, I, I, I'm afraid these are such issues that they do make one, um, you know, pull one's hair out and, uh, you know, to feel like, um, you know, here you've got a situation where, uh, you know, I, I just don't get it sometimes, Katie, why it is that the West has such a superior um, ability to shape public opinion globally. It's not just because, you know, of CNN and Western media and so on. I think they take this stuff more seriously. They are more sophisticated in the way they do this. You know, I, I just think that these other countries are amateurs in 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 the in in getting their views across. You know, they they just don't seem to know how to do it. Um, you know, the Russians, the Chinese, and others, they, they just are on the back foot all the time. Um, the West has really had a hundred year advantage in driving a, a narrative, and because of this international division of humanity, um, there's a way in which they have enormous consent inside their own societies that. Journalists, friends of mine will say, always say, you know, we were reporting the Syria war in, in, from Beirut 
and you'd meet them and they'd say things like, you know, I wish Obama did something because the assumption, default assumption, even a relatively critical mm -hmm. journalist is that the United States is a benevolent power. Um, the default assumption and you know, it's like you wish Obama did something. What do you want him to do? Right. What does the United States government do in this situation? It bombs the hell out of civilians. That's what it does. Um, an interesting comment that we got from Will Kaur is uh, Zelensky banned 11 political parties today, invoking martial law. Five of these parties were avowedly socialist by name. Other parties were left and pro-peace negotiations. And then Mark Ames tweeted, um, interesting that Zelensky isn't banning Ukraine's neo-fascist parties like Svoboda or the Azov neo-Nazis. He can't, obviously. Well, um, if you watch PBS News, and I don't suggest you do, you'll have the intrepid Jane Ferguson um, on their reporting from the front line saying things like, over here is democracy. She's referring to Ukrainian land. And over there is, uh, you know, basically authoritarianism. Well, that's interesting. Um, yes, it's true. Zelensky did ban 11 parties today, but this is not new. Uh, they had in the last period under Petro Poroshenko, his predecessor, they banned communist parties. Uh, they banned anything to do with essentially the left. Um, you know, some small groups were allowed to operate, but they essentially, you know, proscribed communism, Marxism and so on before. Um, so this is not exactly a departure. This is part and parcel of the same thing. At the same time, Mr. Petro Poroshenko, again, Zelensky's predecessor, um, allowed ultra-nationalist groups to thrive. Um, Mr. Zelensky, you know, despite his own statement about, you know, being Jewish and so on, seems not to be overly worried about the um, the growth of, of not only, uh, you know, groups like the Azov Battalion and so on, but to bring back the, the legacy of people like Stefan Bandera and, you know, people who... Bandera is a complicated character. He did spend some time in a Nazi concentration camp. So he's a complicated character, but he is a essentially Ukrainian fascistic nationalist, um, you know, and, and there is that. Now, look, Katie, um, I, I'm not an expert in, in Ukraine and, and, and Russia, but I'm an old fashioned journalist. So the moment things like this happened from 2014, I immediately went and read a lot of things about the long history of Ukraine, the long history. I was actually pretty surprised to find out that um, for 400 years, there was something called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. 80% uh, of the world's Jews today uh, are descended from people who lived in that Commonwealth. 80% from that one region, which went from the Baltic Sea all the way down to the Black Sea and a little further down into Moldova. Um, this... Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, they elected their kings. This is, you know, before the French Revolution. It's pretty amazing, you know, thing what they did there. The capital was Krakow and then it was, uh, was Warsaw. That's the reason Warsaw is to the east of Poland. It was actually the center of the Commonwealth. But with modern Poland, it's towards the east. And, you know, what I found which was interesting is the principal contest was between the Duchy of Moscow um, this is the Grand Duchy before the Tsarist Empire uh, and the, um, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. They had a lot of tension between each other. There are also old histories here about Russian chauvinism and Ukrainian chauvinism and so on. This is not just a conflict that started in February 2022, you know, Putin good, Putin bad. No, this is not even about simply the Euromaidan coup of 2014, you know, Vicky Newland in the Euromaidan saying, yats, yats, get yats, throw out, um, you know, etc. get Poroshenko later. Yeah. It's not just that. These are also old histories. People in the new world, as it were, not so new, but whatever, in the Americas uh, have a much lighter history, historical um, experience. But in older countries where there's an unbroken history from the past, don't un underestimate the power of these kind of, of, of old chauvinisms that rear up. You know, Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, to his great credit, wrote a lot about the dangers of great Russian chauvinism. And by the way, here's another example of, of the kind of intimate but tense relation between Ukraine and Russia. The Saint Vladimir, Vladimir Putin, is named Vladimir, so was Vladimir Lenin. 
Um, Russia claims Vladimir as their main saint. So does Ukraine, but they call him Vladimir. Um, and so these are places of great intimacy and tension. And you got to understand that, that, you know, this is not about Putin. This is not even about Logans and Donets and, you know, these are also old histories. What's amazing, Katie, is when the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, it collapsed with almost no violence. You know, Uzbekistan, SSR became a country and, and Ukraine became a country in Georgia. Look at the difference in Yugoslavia. In Yugoslavia, NATO intervened immediately in 1990 when Croatia broke away. Uh, half a million Krajinan Serbs were expelled in a major ethnic cleansing in Croatia in 1995, now completely forgotten. And NATO goes and bombs that country in 1999. I have a whole theory of why NATO bombed Yugoslavia in 99, but it was with immense violence that Yugoslavia was broken up and NATO played a role in it. Actually, the Soviet Union collapsed with, in a sense, you know, in peace. This is also a um, part of the kind of delayed effect of breaking up something like the USSR. But none of this is in the discussion. It's all yeah. about Putin good, Putin bad. I can't imagine how people can live with such a shallow understanding of a conflict. You know, okay, tomorrow Putin has a heart attack and dies. Do you think everything is going to change? Yeah. It's ridiculous. And what is your theory about why NATO was involved? Well, thank you so much. Um, any final words? I mean, what you just did was a great final final uh, call for action. So um, unless there's anything else that you want to add. Well, it's great to be with you. And I hope that um, you will be on the air for a long time yet and not um, go the way of some of our friends who, um, who because of an association with RT, um, have been have lost their their place to uh, on on these corporate networks. Yeah. Let, let's be clear: YouTube is not a U.S. government network. It's owned by a corporation, and that a corporation would collude with the government um, to throw out journalists uh, raises serious questions about the freedom of the press. So, I hope very much, Katie, that uh, may you go long and prosper. Thank you, and thank you so much, Vijay Prashad, and everyone follow him on Twitter and at his. Um at Globetrotter, and I'll put the link in the YouTube description. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. That was great. Wow. He's such a great guest. I'm so excited. So guys, if you're, if you watch this live, I'm sure you're very exhilarated and moved because that was so great. If you're watching this later and you want to see the full stream, which you will, because he gives, uh, Vijay, uh, provides the theory that I asked him about the theory about NATO bombings. You're going to want him to hear that talk about China, talk about this idiotic PBS reporter, then please become Patreon supporters at the $5 level at patreon.com slash the Katie helper show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie helper show. And you're not just supporting this show and keeping it happen, which is of course something that we would love for you to do. And that we want to thank all the people who are already doing that, but you also get extended interview and, um, exclusive content, including the very great nuggets with um, Vijay Prashad. Uh, also, some other great nuggets you get if you become Patreon supporters is a great chat that I had with uh, Yasha Levine, who is a Soviet-American uh, immigrant who uh, and writer who talked to me about the Azov Battalion, the Azov Battalion, uh, fascinating chat. Also, an extended interview I did with Katrina Vandenhuvel and Matt Taibbi, and I'll be... Um, giving more uh, Patreon content out. Of course, every week I do that. Also, last week we have some great Patreon-only content from Alan McLeod, where we talk about um, Sasha Baron Cohen. We also talk about uh, Bill Gates, and we talk about a uh, just some like really interesting and important ways that the media reports differently on things when it happens here versus when it happens over there, and double standards, and why it is that Russian uh, oligarchs are called oligarchs and American oligarchs are called businessmen or philanthropists. So all that and more at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. You can also become members of this YouTube channel and you can do that. You get badges and special emojis, including Bodhi emojis. I want to thank um, Brad and Tyler, of course, for working on the show, their hard work, which helps make this happen. And I also want to thank um, Phantom Asfanta for doing clips, uh, live clips during the show. Also, um, come on down if you're not already uh, call-in subscribers. I mean, call-in people, not subscribers. If you don't already have the call-in app, 
You just download it, download it onto your phone. You can do an iPhone or an Android. Um, it's just called the Colin app. It's called Colin. You'll find my show. It's our, it's linked in the description here, and you can also access it uh, just from your browser. But if you want to ask us questions, then you'll want to do it from your phone. Also, I'm the co-host of the show um, Useful Idiots, and tomorrow at 11 a.m. at Useful Idiots. No, at youtube.com slash useful idiots, we will be doing our, no, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll be doing our, uh, hey, Terrell, provost, uh, new member, thanks. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Okay, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Let me back up. Sunday morning at 10 a.m. No. Monday morning at 10 a.m. We do something called Monday mornings for useful idiots. So Aaron Mati and I do a live show on YouTube, and that is at youtube.com slash useful idiots that's from 10 a.m to 11 a.m where we respond to the sunday morning shows that we watch so that you don't have to and then right after on call in monday at around 11 a.m we do a call in show on for useful idiots so check those out so i just gave you a lot of stuff to do you can now go over on sunday night catch the call in show for the katie helper show then monday morning you can do monday mornings at 10 a.m on youtube YouTube.com slash the case, YouTube.com slash useful dance. Then I call in at 11 a.m. Okay, you get it. It's all in it. It's all here. Yeah. All right. And thank you so much for coming by. And we will see you next week. Okay. Bye, everyone. Don't forget to become Patreon supporters to see this full episode. Patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's Patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. <laughs>